I'm delighted to be here, delighted to have you all here. It's a, it's a single honor to have uh, Governor Thompson here, uh, both because of his uh, distinguished career and record, but also the fact that uh, among a, a generation of governors where there's been a number of very important innovators, really there have been few who have had the kind of impact, foresightedness, and, and willingness to tackle the big challenges that the country has been facing. I think Governor Thompson, both during his uh, record setting four terms as governor of Wisconsin, where uh, his program, Wisconsin Works, really revolutionized thinking about welfare policy in the country and had a huge impact on the adoption of the welfare reform proposals uh, on the national level. But then uh, for his work uh, when he became Secretary of HHS uh, in 2001, he served from 2001 to 2005, and really critically important ties with country. In addition to his uh, important work uh, in the, uh, the Medicare reform and uh, the development of the Medicare package for the Bush administration. He also worked on a broad range of issues of public health and uh, the, the complex problems around uh, health and uh, homeland security, which uh, for those of us who teach in this space is a really critically important question about how we begin to bring together our traditional domestic agencies to deal with that, the problems of health are not national and foreign, but they're not global. And dealing with disease uh, abroad is important to dealing with uh, health at home as the traditional health issues are at home. Um, he, um, after leaving HHS, uh, he joined uh, Deloitte, Deloitte um, which is a, a, a consulting firm with we, which we have very uh, strong ties, uh, Bob Campbell, the senior uh, uh, officers at Deloitte, a graduate of the LBJ School from our early years as a friend of the LBJ School, and so we've, we've been grateful for the collaboration we've uh, been able to have with Deloitte. And uh, under Governor Thompson's leadership and working with the uh, Deloitte Center on uh, Health Solutions, the governor has launched a, a program uh, on called Medicaid Makeup uh, to help begin to think about uh, how we really begin to address what is one of the great challenges of our country, which is the issue of problem providing a quality and affordable access for the underserved uh, in our country to health care, but also uh, to deal with the looming fiscal crisis around Medicaid, and particularly to uh, uh, look at how we can harness the, the possibility for innovation and experimentation at the state level uh, to deal with these challenges. He pioneered the work on Medicaid waivers uh, while he was at uh, HHS and is now working in the private sector with NGOs and the government to think about uh, some of these solutions. So, we're very fortunate uh, to have him here. Um, it's uh, uh, particularly appropriate during the Thompson Conference Center. I told him we didn't just name it for today, but it's, uh, it's a single line. Uh, I, I think it's also important to know he passed it in addition to his work with Dwight. And Governor Thompson has formed an exploratory committee, uh, and uh, we may be seeing and hearing more of him on the national campaign trail, as well as such an important voice uh, in health policy uh, uh, in the country. He also is affiliated with the uh, law firm of Bacon Gump. Uh, which is also kind of very much tied us uh, here at the uh, University of Texas, a firm that uh, uh, Ambassador Robert Strauss helped found, and who's been a very generous supporter and friend for the LPJ School and the University of Texas. So, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. John Thompson. Thank well, thank you very much, Dean. It's uh, an honor for me to be introduced by you, and uh, I really appreciate getting a chance to know you better. Congratulations on your tremendous career. Very sad about the fact that uh, that Republican wayward motorist ran into you. And uh, I, I wish you the best in your recovery very quickly. And I thank you for your very generous and kind introduction. I also want to say the same thing to my very good friend, Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, who is uh, part of the LBJ School. I. Uh, Worked with uh, Eduardo when he was Commissioner of Health, but more importantly, he was my soulmate in the uh, Border Health uh, Commission. And uh, he and I have got a passion for making sure that poor people uh, get covered uh, on both sides of the border. And I really thank you so very much, Eduardo. I'm sorry you're out of government, but very happy you're here at the school. And I'm also very pleased to find that a couple people from Wisconsin, from Hurley, Wisconsin, uh, came uh, down to Texas and are in the audience. But I want to talk to you today just not about Medicaid because I don't think you can really look at health care and just look at one, one specific thing. I really sincerely believe that we have to take a holistic approach to the reformation of health care in America. And I'm going to touch on a lot of subjects. I will do it as quickly as possible so we have some time for some questions and I know everybody is busy. But I really have to tell you 
you know, that the health care system in America is very good, but it has huge problems. And unless we address those problems, the health care system that we really enjoy and appreciate in this country has the possibility of being completely transformed for the worse. I'm trying to transform it for the best. Now, there is a fine line of distinction, you know, which is good and bad. But I think overall, the direction that I'm going is not got any philosophical bent to it. It really is addressing the problem, I think, in a common sense approach. So first off, you have to understand health care in order to fix it. You got to realize that health care in America costs two trillion dollars. That's 16 percent of the gross national product. And most countries in the world are less than 10 percent. Japan, the second largest economic power in the world, is at 8 percent. And how does that impact the economy? Well, first off, all you have to do is look at the sector of the automobiles being manufactured in this country. General Motors has to spend five and a half billion dollars in order to sustain its private health care system, the largest private health care system in America. And it has to put in $1,525 per automobile, per automobile in order to sustain its health care system. And Toyota, which is now the number three automobile manufacturer in the world, is soon going to overtake Ford, and soon, well, within the next 15 months, will overtake General Motors. They have to put in $225. So you can see what happens. Trying to be a competitive when you have to sell an automobile with $1,525 that costs only $225 for Toyota, you're at an economic disadvantage. That's going to get worse because in six years, the cost of health care is going to double. It's going to go from $2 trillion to $4 trillion. It goes from 16% of GDP to 21% of GDP. And that will make most of our businesses that deal internationally a very non-competitive type of business, just because of the cost of health care. The second thing, after the Second World War, we had a law in the books that said, you know, that you cannot increase salaries and wages. There was a wage freeze during and right after the Second World War. So companies being innovative said, we're going to set up a program in order to attract employees by giving them health insurance, which was born in this country, employer-owned, operated health insurance for the vast number of employees, the vast number of people in this country. In fact, 82 percent of the people had employer-owned, operated uh, health insurance. Most decisions were made by the employer. As a result, employees in America didn't have to make any really difficult decision as to what doctor to go to, what hospital, what they had to pay. As a result of that, consumers in America are really not very sharp or bright about how to purchase health care in America. As a result of that, there really is no questions as to what a doctor says or what hospital you go to. You go where the insurance company points you. As a result of that, we need to change that and have more of a consumer-oriented health care direction in this country. The third and biggest thing is, is the fact that Medicare starts going broke in 2013. That's only six years from now. Medicare is this huge bureaucratic price control system of health care. It starts going broke in 2013. Up until 2013, most people don't realize that Medicare is shedding off a profit. It doesn't spend all of its money, and the money goes into the Treasury. And do you know what happens to money goes into the Treasury? It's spent by Congress. And so Congress has been giving IOUs for the last 28 years. 2013, no longer does that money go into the Treasury. Congress is going to have to supplant the programs that's been funded by Medicare dollars with new taxpayer dollars, plus they're going to have to write a check to Medicare in order to make sure that Medicare continues. Congress doesn't have any money. So Congress is going to be forced with three decisions. One, go to a complete price control system in this country. Or number two, it's going to have to go to a, a government single-payer system, or three, it's going to have to raise taxes. 
Now, I don't particularly like any one of the three options, so I speak a lot all across America, and I appreciate this opportunity to come in front of individuals that can make a difference, can make a difference about health policy, health decisions in America. And I would like to help steer that and then open it up for questions. And you can question my, my premises, you can question my facts, you can question the direction I'm going with your own direction, and I would appreciate that. Now, when you look at this, you got to realize that there has to be an opportunity to change. Because none of us want to see, you know, a system that's completely price controlled. None of us like to pay taxes. So we should try and fix and save the system. I've got a vested interest. I happen to like the health care system, and I want to change it for the better to make it more affordable and more accessible. And that's what I'm talking about. And I also believe the 2008 presidential election is going to be fought in this country for the first time over which person, which party has the best ideas on health care and energy independence in this country. I believe that sincerely. And that's why today I would like to talk to you about my ideas about transforming it and about trying to fix the health care system to make it more affordable and accessible. First, let's look at it. We said $2 trillion. 93% of that $2 trillion goes to what? It goes to people that are sick and go in the hospital or see a doctor. Did you ever stop and think of this? 93% of $2 trillion goes to wait till people get sick. Less than 7% of $2 trillion keeps people healthy in the first place. Now, would anybody in their right mind set up a system like that? No, you wouldn't. You would want to be able to have some sort of a prevention, some sort of a wellness system to make sure that people stay healthy so you don't spend the money. So let's take a look at that. We've seen that 93% goes for a curative system. I want to change that to a wellness system. I want to put a good share of that 93%, add to the 7%, into disease prevention, into wellness. Make people healthy. Make people take care of their health. Make people ask questions about their health. So let's take another look at it. Out of that 93%, 75% of the cost of health care in America goes for chronic illnesses. You know, people say, you know, we're pretty healthy. We're Americans. We're strong. We're virile. We're tough. We're Americans. The truth of the matter is, we're not very healthy in this country. 125 million of our population has one or more chronic illnesses. So we're not very healthy. And now if we want to change that, you have to go where the money's being spent. When Willie Sutton was asked, why do you rob bank? What was his answer? That's where the money is. If you want to change health care, you've got to go where the money is. That's where chronic illness comes in. The first big item in chronic illnesses of that 75% goes for tobacco. Those were tobacco-related illnesses, and I'm very anti-tobacco. And I hope you are too, but I'm sure some of you smoke in this room. And I tell everybody that smokes, if you smoke, and I ask you to walk from that wall to that wall on that line across the center of this, of this auditorium, you'd give up 14 years and six months of your life. How many would walk that walk? Nobody would. But 60% of smokers give up 14 years in six months of your life. Now, I'm really anti-smoking, so I used to go around when I was Secretary of Health and Human Services, walk around the building and take cigarettes out of people's mouths. <laughs> no, I, I got slapped a couple times, people got a little bit crazy, but I wanted to show, you know, that I was leading and that it was wrong to smoke. I finally got so upset that I made people cross the street and go to EPA and smoke. <laughs> now that was a real downer, but I did it, you know, to stress the point, to get people to stop smoking. And when I would tell my business clients, and what I would tell you, you know, we should, we should have some way in this country to encourage people to not smoke. 70% of smokers want to quit. Did you know that? 70% of smokers want to quit. So why don't we help them? Why don't we put a surcharge, and I'm a Republican, or a tax on tobacco? 
put a surcharge or a tax, and don't let the government get the money, but put it into a fund for smokers to quit smoking. You would drive up the cost of cigarettes, which would make young people not start smoking, and you would have a fund there to help smokers stop smoking. I also encourage businesses to increase the premiums, but also tell their employees, instead of increasing the premiums, if you quit, we'll give you some dividends, and we'll help you stop smoking. I also would regulate nicotine. Nicotine and tobacco kills 442,000 Americans last year from tobacco-related illness costing $155 billion. $155 billion. So, why not regulate? Some of you take baby aspirins, like I do, for your health. Take a baby aspirin every morning. You know that baby aspirins are regulated by FDA? Nicotine isn't. Does that make any sense at all? And so government has got to play a role in change. Next big one is diabetes. Big problem in Texas. Dr. Eduardo Sanchez can tell you the Latino population in Texas has got an epidemic on diabetes. Last year, 18 million Americans were type 2 diabetic. This year, 21 million Americans are type 2 diabetic. But what scares me is that there are 41 million more Americans, like you and me, out there that are pre-diabetic. And in three to five years, we'll become diabetics. And we'll cost you the system, will go up from $145 billion to $400 billion, and from one out of $14 going for diabetes, one out of $8. We can't afford it. But we have found, we have found that what? We have found that if you walk 30 minutes a day, lose five to 10 percent of your body weight, you can prevent type two diabetes by 60 percent, and that's huge. Government has a role. State government in Texas has a role to make sure that you educate people about diabetes. We should have nutrition. We should have individuals. We should have you know people eating properly, especially educating minorities. The third thing is, is obesity. You know, we can look in the mirror in the morning and say, hmm, you know, well, Chunky's good, but swim is better. And I come from the state of Wisconsin where every meal tastes better with beer, brats, cheese, and cream. <laughs> but you'll have to do something about the obesity question in America. And I'm encouraging Catholic Canadians. You know, I would, I would have the cafeteria at the University of Texas put out salads, vegetables, and subsidize it. For a hamburger, I'd charge you five bucks, for a cheeseburger, ten bucks, and twenty cents for every French fry. <laughs> you would change the attitude, and you would make your students and your public a lot healthier. What I'm saying is chronic illness. Number one, 75%. We have to change that. Government has to change it. Government has to help educate. University of Texas has got to help educate it. Second big one is information technology. You know something? You know, doctors have to get straight A's to get into medical school. Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, my friend, had to get a straight A to get into medical school. Except for one grade. You know what the one grade doctors don't have to get a, an A in order to get into medical school? Handwriting. <laughs> and you know something? 98,000 Americans died last year from mistakes made by doctors and hospitals. 98,000. You know of any other business would stay in existence with that kind of a record? Over 50% of it is because, you know, prescriptions are not written properly. Half of the people that die out of the 98,000, wrong medicine, wrong diet, wrong amount, the wrong person. And only 8% of the doctors he prescribed. All of you know what comp pilots are. I know that most of you are looking at them while I'm speaking, so I love you like that. <laughs> and you see this, and you can put in your name. D. James. A little arrogant, but pretty nice guy. 
gives it maladies, accident, medicines, and then he has to come in with another malady and the pump put in the illness, check it, and guess what? Pops up the medicine that will take care of the new malady and any contraindicators of the medicine he's already taken. All of this can be done with this, and immediately the script can go to the insurance company to be paid, the script can go to the pharmacist to read. So we can change American healthcare and information technology overnight and make, make it more efficient and better. Do you all know what a 1040 is and a W2? You all fill them out. You know, April's coming, so you all know it's 1040 is coming, you gotta pay your taxes on it. The most complex tax system in the world that we can get it down to one form to send in the Department of IRS. A W-2, every small employer, large employer, have to fill out a W-2. One form for large or small employers, same form. Don't you think we're smart enough to have one form for healthcare? Medicare is so complex that nobody, even myself when I was secretary, couldn't understand it. And so, if you want to pay for this, you would save $191 billion. And we can go pay for this on just about anything. You can save 10% of the cost of health care. Third area is disease management. You know that 20% of the Americans use up 80% of the resources in health care. So, obviously, if you're smart, like you all are, because you attend the LBJ Public Affairs School, what we should you do? You should manage those people. If some party has severe diabetes, or cardiovascular problems, or is disabled, you should manage their medicines and manage them, and you can do that. You don't have to invade their privacy. You can do it over the telephone, or through web pages. You can be able to monitor each person and you can reduce the amount of expenditures and make that person's health better. And if you improve that person's health, you will improve that person's quality of life. And you would save absolutely billions of dollars by doing that. You can reduce the cost from that 80% down to almost 50%. If you manage intensely people that are using a big portion of the cost of health care. Fourth area, isn't it somewhat sad that 47 million Americans don't have health insurance? Where does the uninsured go for their health care? Emergency room, right? What's the most costly care in the world? Does that make any sense that 47 million people, you require people to get sick then they go to the emergency room where it's the most expensive? absolutely doesn't make any sense at all. Why don't we turn this around and stimulate the economy and cover every man, woman, and child? How would you do it? Well, first off, I'd have the state of Texas pass a law. Pass a law to put all the uninsured into a, into a class. And then have the insurance companies bid on it. Just like they did on you know, on Medicare, on Type D, Part D. And you would find that every insurance company that's licensed to practice health care insurance in Texas would bid on it. Why? It's a huge block. I wouldn't allow the legislature to put any amendments on it. It would just be a bare bones insurance policy bid on by the insurance companies and allow them to put in a policy for individuals as well as family members. And then what you would do, you could put it into Medicaid, or you could have us under S chip and you would cover everyone. And then what I would do is I would put a a stopgap loss of three hundred thousand dollars. Three hundred thousand dollars so that you could put that out for reinsurance. And have, you know, the providers pay for it, the health insurance companies pay for the reinsurance, and you would cover everybody, and every man, woman, and child in Texas could be covered. And you know something? It would be cheaper. And instead of being a, a drag on the economy, it would be a stimulant to the economy. Fifth thing, Medicaid. 
Medicaid is a, is a system that was set up in 1965 with Medicare. There were people in Congress who said, you know, we're going to pass Medicare, we've got to do something for poor people and people with disabilities. So they set up a system that the federal government pays part of, states pay part of, and the federal government sets the rules for it. So Texas has got the same Medicaid program as Wisconsin. Florida's got the same as Massachusetts and Texas. And guess what? Legislators and states are trying to find ways to avoid it. Now for me, I think what we should do is change Medicaid and then place it. Texas gets 60 cents out of every dollar and they have to match it with 40 cents. Now just think mathematically. Now, if I can cover everybody with health insurance and the federal government's gotta pay 60 cents of it, and if we don't come with health insurance, they're poor, they're going to go to the emergency room, the hospitals pay for it, the employers pay for it. Now, if I was enterprising, I would say, you know, that's a good bet. I would take that bet any day of the week. And I'd find a way, you know, to expand it and send the bill to Washington. And you wouldn't have any problems whatsoever. But I also would say, there are other ways to take a look at it. I would split Medicaid. I would split Medicaid, and I would set it up so that the states are responsible for moms, kids, and allow them to innovate. And put the elderly and institutionalized care and the disabled under the federal Medicare system. And what you would do then is you would bring out the best innovation possible. When I was governor, I started welfare reform. Everybody said, you know, you know, you're crazy. Nobody can touch welfare and change it. So what did I do? I brought welfare mothers in to have lunch with me at my executive residence. And I asked those individuals, I said, why don't you work? And they said, you don't work because if I go to work, I'm gonna lose health insurance. I said, if I provide you health insurance, you go to work. They said, yes, but if I go to work, Who's going to take care of my kids during the day? So I said, if I provide you daycare and health care, will you go to work? They said, yes, but I dropped out of school when I was 13 and had a baby and didn't finish school, so I had no job skills. So I said, if I provide you with job skills, daycare and health care, will you go to work? They said, yes, but transportation is needed to get to the jobs in the city or outside the city. And I provided transportation. Was born welfare reform, and that became the law in Wisconsin, and then other governors started competing. Governor Ingram said, well, I'm smarter than Tommy Thompson, and he's getting all this publicity, I'm gonna come up with a plan. And governors all over the country started competing. And then the federal government said, those governors are getting good publicity for reducing welfare case laws and getting people to work, then won't pass it. And the federal law was passed 10 years ago and it's still the law of the land, and 75% of that comes from the state of Wisconsin, my state, which I'm very proud of. It was the biggest social change in 50 years, but it started with innovation. Now, can you imagine if the states just had to take care of acute care for moms and children? Texas could say that we're gonna make sure that every mother, every woman gets their pap screens and their mammogram. And then what happens, Governor Perry could brag to every other state that they have got the healthiest women in the country. And governors love to brag. I was one of them. I know that. Next governor can look in South Carolina and say, I want to make sure that every child gets vaccinated. And then they can brag and say they got the most healthy children in the country. And you would start competing and what you would come out of there is innovation out of Medicaid to make sure that people have health care and that it's affordable and accessible and people understand it. Finally, Medicare. I told you Medicare is going broke. And I asked the dean, he had to leave to go to a doctor's appointment. And he told me that before he came in, he didn't get bored, I hope. But, 
But the truth of the matter is, Medicare is going broke. And we have to change that. And when I asked the dean, I said 40% of the cost of Medicare comes in the last six to nine months of a person's life. And in this country, none of us want to talk about death. You know, we just find that offensive. The Terry Shallow case, remember that case? It tied up Congress for months, weeks, and then a month. Because nobody, you know, wanted to talk about the fact that Terry Shiloh, without the artificial means, was going to die. Nobody wanted that. We are so afraid of it. When mom and dad goes into the hospital and got terminal cancer, and they need a transplant, and they only got three months left to live, we're going to argue to get them a transplant. Because that's what we do as sons and daughters. And so I asked the dean, I said, what I really would like to see happen in this school is to have somebody develop a course, a lecture series, about the meaning of death, health care, and have a multidisciplinary discussion about it because we need to. We have to figure out a way, you know, to deal with it. United Kingdom. They come up with a blanket thing that nobody over the age of 55, I think, or 58, can get a transplant. I would not support that. But at least they're willing to set a policy and say that a person should not get a, tra get a transplant in all their elder years. And maybe that's, maybe that's not 55, maybe it's 75, I don't know. But there should be a discussion and there should be a lecture search. And that's what we have to do. So ladies and gentlemen, my common sense solution is, first, change the system to wellness. Two, manage diseases. Three, use information technology. Four, cover everybody with health insurance. Five, split Medicaid and be venturous and be aggressive for applying for waivers to change Medicaid to cover more people. And six, change Medicare but have a well-educated discussion, a multidisciplinary discussion about the meaning of death and how we're going to deal with the demographics of people like myself that are in the Medicare age now and getting older. How do we deal with that kind of a problem in America? So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for listening to me and I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Questions? Yes. I'm Jackie Young, now I'm with the faculty at the Young Day School. I'm interested in your agenda item dealing with the uh, changes in Medicare. In light of the uh, new modern, uh, Medicare Modernization Act and prescription uh, drug plan, Part D, what would you uh, do about that? Which, could you comment on that? Absolutely. I was uh, responsible for a good portion of that, so. You can well imagine I'm very supportive of it. Uh, <clears throat> the faculty member, what's your name? Jackie. Jackie. Asked me what I thought of Part D of the Medicare Modernization Act. Part D, for years we only had Part A and Part B. Part A takes care of the hospitals, Part B takes care of the doctors. And people around the country were asking for the government to pass a law to be able to provide for drugs for seniors. Both political parties, you know, campaigned on it for years, 12 years. When George Bush got elected president, and then he appointed me as secretary, he called me into the office and he says, I campaign on it, I want a program developed that's going to deliver pharmaceutical drugs to the seniors of our society. We sat down and we looked at it, we saw that Medicare was going broke, and we decided we would try a new model, a model based upon competition, a model based upon accountability and allowing the free enterprise system to work. And what we did was we set up a system whereby insurance companies could bid on providing pharmaceutical drugs to the seniors. It was a controversial thing because 
people in Washington said, we shouldn't do that, we should have the government do it. And we argued on the other side, we should try a different model. The different model was finally passed, passed in the House of Representatives, as a matter of fact, at 6.30 in the morning one day, and I was there trying to get people to vote for it. It passed, and it was very complex, because to start up a system like that, that could deliver medicines to 40-some million Americans, you know, it would be like having the Austin newspaper having to start out afresh and have to deliver newspapers to every person without a mistake in the city of Austin. Oh, this is more complex. This is across the nation. And we did it, and there were a lot of bumps along the way. A lot of confusion, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of debates, and a lot of people that were opposed to it. But we started it, it started a year ago, and it is now working extremely well. We had a lot more competition than we ever thought possible. We thought if we could get three, maybe five companies that would bid nationally, we'd be successful. We got 12. We thought that if we could get maybe 10 regional or state uh, companies to bid on it, we would be happy. We got some, something well over 50. Tremendous competition, which drove down the prices, made it more efficient. And the nice thing that I can report to you is that 80% of the elderly like their program, 80%. I don't know of any other government program in the country right now that can get 80% approval. Part D has got an 80% approval rating from the seniors who are in the program, and there are 37 million out of 42. So I'd say it's working. And what it's doing, it's driving down or stabilizing the cost of drugs because if that insurance company is not offering it, there is another insurance company willing to step up and take on that responsibility. So I think the free enterprise model has worked, and I think that uh, the success is by the popularity of the people of the program who now are saying it is very, very good. Still isn't perfect, and there still can be changes and modifications, but overall I'm very happy with it. Sir. It is not the competition which is really the medical part the price thing down. Is the senior doesn't want to reach to the donor hole. So this year, 70, 67% of seniors has taken generic drug. Previously, they used to take, 45% used to take drug, which is a patent. So the price which has come down is the really senior are conscious about how much they will spend so they do not beat the donor code. So it's not the competition, but it's a simple switch. And it's a nice financial incentive is given to the people that can you switch from the patented drug to generic drug. And this was done this year. There is some of that, sir, but the truth of the matter is is that, that seniors didn't have a choice at all before Part D. And this is everybody that's in it is going to save money. And that that is that is the reason for it. And now some seniors, in order to avoid the donor vote, will take generics rather than patented drugs. This, this year, this report yesterday came 67% switch to generics. Well, I don't find that uh, that's anything wrong with that. Yeah, nothing wrong with it, because the people choose people, the people, The people are getting smart about buying medicines and buying healthcare. That is going to, in the end result, sir, be able to make our healthcare system more competitive. And I'm all for that. And it's making consumers all over this country smarter shoppers, like they are for automobiles, like they are for houses, like they are for their clothes. They're becoming a lot smarter in buying health care. And that is going to benefit the whole system. And secondly, you talk about the preventive care. In this capitalist society, where is the money for preventive care? Mm -hmm. For me, I'm a physician, I can earn more. If I give that to you gotta, we got to change the reimbursement system, doctor. Yes, sir. We gotta, right now, you have to do so many procedures to get paid for. You cannot give me an extensive physical examination because you cannot afford it. You spend roughly the average in America is nine minutes with a patient. And as soon as you come in, you got to look at your watch and figure out you got to be out in nine minutes. 
And that's, and that's a tough way to practice medicine. I don't know if you're a, a general practitioner or if you're a specialist, but that's what it is. Well, but the thing is, you've got to start reimbursing for health care and wellness. And then, doctor, you have a chance to change the system. But the reimbursement system doesn't allow you to do it. The reimbursement system pays you for the procedure that you have to do. But this is what the UK does. I think we have to look at the UK system 10 years from now. Not now, but 10 years from now. I don't they think we, we, we haven't got 10 years, sir. Yeah, the big general practitioners, they give them certain money and they take care of it. Keep them healthy, you keep the extra money. Well, we're not that far apart, but yeah. thank you. Other questions? Yes. So I know you're a big fan of Steve Innovation. I was wondering if you could talk about, or if you know of any innovative ideas that are coming out of states right now through Medicaid waivers or anything yes. that's promising to you? Um, New Mexico's got a, got a waiver in to allow individuals to purchase commercial health insurance under Medicaid. Uh, uh, Kansas has got a, a waiver in to provide wellness and, uh, and nutrition uh, to, uh, to individuals that are, that are uh, poor and, and need the help. Uh, uh, Georgia has got a waiver in to allow disabled individuals get paid for it to counsel other members that are disabled as to how to purchase services and how to be able to make the Medicaid dollars last long. Florida's got an interesting thing on electronic technology <coughs> that is working. And uh, Massachusetts, of course, has used uh, the waiver that I gave uh, Governor Romney uh, my, my last waiver I gave out to use the disproportionate share dollars uh, to cover individuals that don't have health insurance. Uh, those are just the, some of them. Uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania have got a waiver in that I like that uh, allows for people uh, Medicaid to apply for it 24-7 uh, through kiosks and, and through the web pages that you can apply for programs or anything in Medicaid, food stamps, and so on, that you can apply for those type of type of services. Those are just some of them off the top of my head that are out there that I like. Uh, and I think, you know, we have to do more of it. That's why I would like to split Medicaid to give the, the moms and children to the states because I would find, I'm sure that every governor is going to be very innovative then to make sure that their population is as healthy as they possibly can be. Yes, sir. So just following up on, on that point, since you came back to it about the, the moms and the children and the governors, I think it's attractive how you want to match the particular issues to the politicians most likely to make progress on them. And the governors will like the moms and the kids, and maybe the feds already have to worry about the seniors through Medicare and the disabled, but the incremental problem of nursing homes is not insurmountable, and the governors probably don't want to brag about nursing homes. What do you do about the things that people really don't want to brag about? And mental health is the one that comes to mind. Well, I, I think that uh, I think that you're wrong. I think governors would would relish the opportunity. Anyway, I would if I would be still be a governor to make sure that we have the medical parity. We haven't had it in our system, but I believe very much that mental health is the has been the poor stepchild. And it needs a lot more explanation, a lot more attention, and a lot more assistance. And uh, I believe very strongly that there would be some some innovative governors that would stress that and come into that and put in a program that would have pure equity uh, between the general health and mental health. And I think that's that's absolutely necessary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when it comes to mental health and especially support for women and, and young children, um, is there any good way to kind of measure the savings down the road in other systems, the criminal justice system and so forth? Well, I, um, it's obvious there's going to be. You know, uh, uh, I don't know what the population of your prisoners are in. Uh, in, uh, in Texas as far as how many have mental health problems, but it's a high percentage, high percentage in every, in every, uh, every state. Uh, about, we did an assessment in our state when I was governor, I think 65% had mental health 
chemical and uh, alcohol dependency or had problems. And a good share of that, if it would have been taken care of earlier, they would not have ended up in an institution. So I don't know if that is a, a common percentage across, but I, I know every state, it's over 50% of their pop prison population has mental and, and chemical drug addiction problems. And so if you address them early on, especially through moms and kids, I think you stand a very good chance of keeping those individuals, some of those individuals, out of prison. But uh, quantitatively, I don't know exactly how much, uh, how you would be able to determine that, but there's no question in my mind it would be a huge savings. Yes, sir. So, Compton, do you uh, comment a little bit about your thoughts, uh, pros and cons of the Massachusetts Health Program that's moving forward and the one that's been proposed in California? Um, well, first off, I think the uh, uh, Massachusetts plan is, uh, I give it the waiver, uh, so I feel I'm, I'm partially responsible for it. And so I think that the Massachusetts plan, the California plan, is going to accomplish the same thing that happened on welfare. When I started welfare, other states uh, <clears throat> started Compliant. The best thing that happened in the Massachusetts plan, it was the first big attempt to cover the uninsured. And as a result of that, I said in my speeches that I would bet anybody in the room a hundred bucks to five bucks that before the state of the unions, the state of the states, the state of, in the budgets, that over 25% of the states would follow through and have a program on the uninsured and on Medicaid. And you're seeing what's taking place. It's an explosion. You know, it started with Massachusetts, California's got one, Minnesota's got one, Michigan's got one, Pennsylvania's got one, Vermont's got one, and Maine's got one, um, uh, Wisconsin's got one, Illinois's got one, Iowa's got one, all of these states, and, and Texas as, as well, your state. Every state is following through. Because governors look to what's happening out there and they want to be, you know, at the cutting edge of innovation. And that's what's going to take place. So the good thing about Massachusetts and California, it's stimulating a lot of innovation and a lot of applications for Medicaid waivers. Uh, what's bad about it, of course, is it depends upon where you're sitting. If you're an employer in Massachusetts and California, you're, a lot, you're not going to be happy with the assessments and the mandates. And so you gotta you gotta balance that. I for one believe the mandates for health insurance is all right. We mandate insurance for automobiles. You know, you can't drive in Texas without automobile insurance. You can't drive in any state, you know, with, without automobile insurance. It's a mandate. But it's certainly something that we should discuss in this country, and I think that's possible. Yes, I gotta go, I guess, uh, my, my, my my partner is telling me that I have to catch a plane, so I... We haven't talked much about long-term services and supports other than the idea of moving it to Medicare. In Texas, we have HHS, and we have the waiver. Can you talk about I can't hear you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You haven't talked um, very much about long-term services. Because I ran out of time. But um, in Texas, we have over 87,000 people on 1915C community-based waiver waiting lists. Right. We have about 5,000 folks in state schools where we pay $111,000 a year to support them, um, 111 per person. Can you tell me where, um, talk a little bit about your ideas for how we could end the institutional bias and, and improve services for communities? For the elderly? No, for people with disabilities. Well, with disabilities? Well, yes, if you look at the last report that I issued uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services, we were trying to get the money to follow a person. We're trying to educate the individuals to be able to purchase their own services. And be all, also they have vouchers to be able to stay in their own home. I believe very strongly that the federal government is making a terrible mistake 
by not giving a tax deduction for individuals who want to take care of people that are disabled or people that are seniors, instead of you know having them put in their nursing home. What's so wrong about getting the tax deduction for that? What's so wrong with giving a voucher for an individual to make a determination that the money that's going to be cost to go into into an institution should go with the individual and allow that individual to purchase services? Those are the things that you, we got to be innovative. We got to be smart about about healthcare, and, and I don't think we are. We're too locked into making one rule and one law for everybody. And it works out that it becomes very inefficient. I like innovation. I like to be able to, when I started a program in, uh, in uh, Wisconsin, it was uh, 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 a voucher program to allow individuals to stay in their own home instead of going to the nursing home. First state in the country to do that. This worked out very effectively. I also set up a program in Wisconsin that allowed uh, for individuals to uh, go to the county and be able to purchase services and have different vendors bid on those services and allow the individual and his or her family to go and to buy the services that they need. The problem is, is that when you have a plan to think and, and you get a, you have to have institutionalized care, you have to take everything. If you allowed an individual to be at home, maybe you wouldn't need 24-hour services. Maybe you wouldn't need a ventilator every, you know, every day. Maybe if you had a ventilator, maybe you had somebody come in, you know, scrub the dishes and, and make a meal for you. You could you could still survive in your own home or have somebody. You don't have it in Texas, but somebody has to come and and uh, shovel the walk, turn up the heat, or mow the grass in the summertime. And those are the kinds of things that if we were able to do them and to purchase services and allow the individual to do it, that individual could stay in his or her home. It would not cost $111,000 for that person. You would save money and you would improve that person's quality of health and quality of life. I also am big on, on Alzheimer's. Uh, having community centers take care of Alzheimer's patients during the day so mom, pop, or son and daughter can take care of that person in the evening. Instead of, if you if we set it up and paid for a community daycare center for people that have mental health problems and allow the child, you know, to continue on with his or her life and be able to have a meaningful job and allow that person to go for daycare during the day instead of having that person placed in an institution seven days a week 24 hours a day, can you imagine how much dollars, how many dollars you would save? You want to respond? Well, we have, um, we have the waivers, we have money for all the person, we have consumer directed services. What we don't have is the political will to make the really um, difficult choices like closing the state schools. And then when you have 87,000 on a waiting list, we don't have the money to buy the services in the community. Well, it's costing more to keep the, those people in institutions. And I think you'd find, find, you gotta find the political world to change the system. Can I ask two quick questions? Yes. Um, extremely unrelated questions. First of all, uh, regarding the devastation to New Orleans, our hometown, um, Devastation of one of the devastation of the like the hospitals in New Orleans for the yeah, right. training. Should the federal government be spending more on hospital uh, reconstruction in New Orleans? And second unrelated question, are you running for president or not? <laughs> I think that uh, the federal government <clears throat> screwed up with Katrina big time. I don't think we were prepared. I think our implementation was bad. I think that uh, uh, we should have, uh, I don't think we should have taken the doctors and the medical uh, response teams away from HHS and put them into Homeland Security. I think they would have done a much better job under the supervision of the Secretary of Health to get on and take care of individuals. I think that hospitals, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, should have been uh, able to be rebuilt. The ones that are necessary. And you have a chance to modernize those hospitals now. And I think there's no question the federal government is going to have to put more money into, into rebuilding uh, Mississippi and uh, Louisiana. I think, I think the president, I think President Bush is, as uh, after a slow start, has been very good about uh, about doing that. Good. And, and I think that we're going to have to do more. Good. You think he's doing a good job now? I think that uh, right now, I don't, you know, I think the president gets criticized for everything. And uh, anytime you have low popularity, you're going to be criticized. But overall, the president has, uh, has taken on some very tough issues, issues that needed to be taken on. And I think, uh, I think that everybody <coughs> needs to, to be responsible for the rebuilding of Katrina. I don't think you can just say, the president is the sole responsible person because okay. con Congress is appropriate. I think there's enough blame to go around. I, I think the president has assumed and has apologized and says that they made mistakes at the beginning and there's still some, a lot of rebuilding to do. And I think the president has taken it on and I, I compliment him for that. But I think, you know, that we have to do a better job. In regards to the second question, I would like to run. I'd like to run. Because I think I got ideas. I think ideas that really matter to the American public on health care, on energy independence, on foreign policy, on setting up a, a new type of way of dealing with foreign policy, which I call medical diplomacy. <laughs> and uh, I would love to see us use our power, our great medical system to be able to use it. One, one example that I, that I use that I hope that you would like we have these two months, just, just one example, and then I gotta go. Two hospitals, we have these two floating ships <coughs> called Mercy and Cover. One, each of them got uh, the most modern hospital ships. The modern hospitals. Got 1,500 beds. And when uh, the tsunami hit, one of them went over to uh, Indonesia, and it was with volunteer doctors and nurses and technicians. It turned the people in Indonesia from being anti-American to being pro-American. And what I would do is I would, if I was president, I would commission those ships to float the high seas and go into developing countries. And then I would put out a competition to every medical school and hospitals in America. And I'd tell the medical schools that I want a competition set up so that the six brightest doctors in your graduating class get the opportunity to serve their residencies on those ships. And can you imagine what that would mean to first that young resident doctor to be able to float on that ship, serve on that ship and go to developing countries in the Middle East and Africa and Asia and take care of the health needs of those people? And what the response would be to see that big ship floating in here into the ports and taking care of poor people that don't have any chance of health care, it would change the image of America overnight and it would make those doctors some of the best doctors in the world. They would see diseases and, and do operations that they probably would never see in their practice. They could send it to New Orleans of the Mississippi River. <laughs> <laughs> You probably would not get up to the Mississippi River unless it was way up had to flood it again. But uh, I just think that that medical diplomacy would work extremely well. And those are some of my ideas that uh, I would like to put in. Thank you very much. It's been a great opportunity.